One of the special responsibilities of the chiefs uh, in arms control, uh, certainly not a formal responsibility, but uh, Congress certainly viewed it as a responsibility, was that the chiefs would testify to Congress whether or not a particular agreement was militarily sufficient and whether violations, if they took place uh, on the part of the other side, would be so militarily significant that the United States and its allies must react. Uh, there, there never was a clear formula for militarily significant cheating. Uh, th there was a clearer formula for how the chiefs went about doing military sufficiency judgments. You've already described the process that the Joint Strategic Target Planning Staff went through, which was basically to, to applied to how you would do the treaty analysis. Uh, there often, though, in negotiating these agreements was a temptation on other parts of the government to take more risks than the chiefs would be comfortable with. Uh, well, let's talk a little about the Reykjavik summit in October of 1986. Uh, President Reagan uh, did take steps at Reykjavik that left the chiefs uncomfortable. Uh, can you talk about that? Yeah, when, uh, you know, again, uh, context is interesting because mm -hmm. the, certainly that particular set of joint chiefs, without exception, very strongly in support of what we had accomplished in arms control and were already looking at the next level. Uh, our people out in Omaha at SAC had, had been doing some really interesting targeting work mm -hmm. on how we could create the deterrent, mm -hmm. sustain exactly the same deterrent strategy, that is holding at risk sets of assets that we knew would cover what they valued most without us having to get inside their minds. Mm -hmm. uh, and we were already aware that we could, we could have a very high degree of sufficiency. So the Reykjavik issue was not about further reduction. The Reykjavik issue was about what, I, what the Joint Chiefs regarded as, well, the president got into a high-stakes poker game, mm -hmm. high-stakes poker game. You know what? Uh, I'll give you the SLBMs, and I'll raise you the ICBMs. Mm -hmm. So they came back with this commitment to do away with ballistic missiles. And in the first place, we couldn't imagine why would the Russians agree to that when we had the bomber superiority. If the Russians were to give up their ICBMs. They had very little left. Mm -hmm. So it just simply was not credible. Second was that giving up the, uh, the ballistic missiles at that point in time, it just, it just didn't make any sense. So Admiral Crowell asked for a session with the President. Mm -hmm. And so Admiral Crowell and I went, I'm Mr. Nuke, we went to this session with the president, and we made in the little situation room, which is very small, mm -hmm. little conference table, maybe 10 people can sit around it, and I'm sitting behind the secretary, or behind Admiral Crow out of the line of fire. And, and McFarlane, the chief staff, was doing everything he could to keep the real subject from coming up. Mm -hmm. He kept raising subjects. And, uh, mm -hmm. The president would respond, and finally Bill Krause said, Mr. President, that's very interesting, but that's not why we're here. The president said, well, Bill, what's on your mind? And he said, well, Mr. President, if you actually present a treaty that does away with our ballistic the Joint Chiefs will have to testify against it before the Foreign Relations Committee. I mean, silence. Shocked silence around the table. President Reagan paused for about five or 10 seconds, seemed like an hour, and said, well, Bill, you know how strongly I have always supported our military forces and how much I believe in the need for an adequate defense. That was the end of it. Subject never came up again. Mm -hmm. That was the equivalent of, there, there, Bill, it's okay. <laughs> <laughs> I tell you, you think, 
You want badge of courage for the chairman to say that to the president. That is a badge of courage. The other lesson from that is President Reagan's response. He didn't, you know, he didn't get angry and froth at the mouth. He thought about it for 10 seconds and made his decision. Mm -hmm. There, Bill, it's okay. <laughs> Another thing that Admiral Crow did, as I recall, uh, was basically say that uh, we chiefs have to be more knowledgeable about the details of arms control than any other senior people in government. And so there was a period of time, uh, I forget how long it was, but it was a fairly significant period of time, where there were meetings in his office. Uh, I don't recall if they were daily meetings, uh, he says two to three times a week. Uh, the chiefs were there, uh, Admiral Fox was there, uh, I was there as the director of the, the division that was doing strategic arms control. Uh, you picked a different subject and tried to get into it in depth each time. Uh, you really dug into the arms control details. You know, the reason that those were successful is, number one, we never departed mm -hmm. from the underlying basis. Mm -hmm. And it was, always, it was always about what does it take to have a sufficient deterrent. Mm -hmm. And uh, it wasn't about numbers. It was about how can you ensure that whatever the potential adversary leadership, whatever they hold most dear, they understand we hold that at risk. Mm -hmm. And as long as we stayed with that, uh, and you had the, the basic issue is, we don't want more nuclear weapons than we need. Mm -hmm. They're expensive. That, uh, that there's inevitably some tiny bit of risk that goes with mm -hmm. <laughs> what, what numbers you have. So it wasn't difficult to have the right motivations. And nothing is as valuable as knowledge. Mm -hmm. You know, is really knowing mm -hmm. what you're doing, not just operating on gut feel and maybe a little prejudice. Let's get back to talking about your counterparts in the Soviet Union. Uh, Marshal Akramayev really immersed himself in the subject also. Uh, he, he had the detail down. Uh, you know, we don't know whether or not he had similar meetings with his staff as, as the Joint Chiefs did, but he certainly uh, knew about arms control. The Soviets always had had a difficulty to, in accepting the notion that the strategic arm was something that threw, flew long distances. There was an artificial distinction between uh, the strategic arms talks and the, the theater talks uh, in their eyes. At the same time that we were negotiating START, we were negotiating the Intermediate Nuclear Forces, or INF, agreement. Uh, the genesis of that agreement basically had been <coughs> that when the Soviets uh, deployed the SS-20 missile, uh, NATO became very concerned uh, on how to respond, uh, the dual track decision was made, uh, the decision that you would pursue arms control, but if you couldn't get the uh, outcome that you wanted out of arms control, you would deploy uh, the American ground launch cruise missile and Pershing II missile. Uh, we begin the theater nuclear force talks uh, late in the Carter administration. They basically go nowhere. Uh, the election takes place, President Reagan takes office. Uh, many of his advisors, I, I don't know how to put it except to say that they were ideologically opposed to arms control. But at the same time, there was the political reality of our commitment to NATO, so we had to begin the INF talks, and we did that. And we pursued the INF talks based on the so-called zero-zero outcome, which was going to be a total elimination of all the ground launched and the, the missiles that would be in the 500 and 5500 kilometer range. Uh, in late 1987, we signed the INF Treaty. It came into effect in 1988. Uh, the, I, I'm not sure that the Soviets ever felt that they got a good deal, that it was an equitable agreement, because they had to give up the SS-20. Well, Akramayev did. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know about his, about his colleagues, but, mm -hmm. you know, they, our attitude towards the 
Pershing and Glickham was, uh, it was a mixed attitude. I think if you're going to get the troops who operate Pershing and Glickham focused on the mission, uh, you, have to, you have to treat it like it is a serious part of deterrence. Mm -hmm. But it also was a little bit of an overhang of war fighting. That, that uh, I think what we didn't realize at the time, that, which came out much, much later, is that we tend to look at the Red Army as, as uh, capable of overwhelming NATO defenses. And that we were going to have to resort to nuclear weapons to stop them. We learned later that, that, and Akhmayov made that very clear to us a bit later. We learned later that they felt even more strongly than we did that they had that situation because mm -hmm. they heard about things like a salt breaker and they they saw our demonstrations and and they were convinced that they were going to lose mm -hmm. conventional war. So. So they too had this sort of confusion about what are these things about. I think the Joint Chiefs, including the Army Chief, pretty much looked at the deployment of INF as a way to get rid of their INF. Mm -hmm. I don't say it was just solely arms control, but I can tell you when it came time to decide we give the INF, uh, we didn't have any struggle with that. Mm -hmm. You didn't. You didn't hear discussions in the tank about, oh, woe is me, we're going to give up the Persian, we're going to give up the Glickham. Mm -hmm. So the, as far as the Soviet attitude, you remember Akramayev came over with Gorbachev mm -hmm. to sign the INF Treaty. It was very instructive because Admiral Crowe invited him to meet with us in the tank. And the rest of the Joint Chiefs were really unhappy about that. Mm -hmm. And I have this, this Soviet leader in our inner sanctum. Mm -hmm. But he invited him into the tank. And, and uh, two things happened that were really instructive. One was that Akhmayev laid out this big map on the, mm -hmm. on the table showing that we have, them, we have surrounded them. And so that he looked at our deployments instead of our deployments as serving our interests, mm -hmm. serving our allies, meeting our commitments. He looked at our deployments as specifically aimed at containing the Soviet Union. 360. Mm -hmm. And it was an interesting, he believed it. The, uh, later during the discussion, I asked Akhmayev, uh, said, why, why is our ballistic missile defense with Star Wars. Why is that such an issue with you? It's just a research and development program. We, we don't even know if we know how to do that. It's years and years away. And he said, but this is America. And if you decide to do it, you will do it, and then we will have to try to match it, and we can't afford to do that. Well, that was really an instructive thing mm -hmm. from Dr. Mayo. Because mm -hmm. I have to tell you, uh, some of Dr. Mayo's positions on arms control, I thought were better than ours. Mm -hmm. He'll never know that. <laughs> but, 